Um, very exciting to be here talking about innovation and entrepreneurship, especially when I can talk about my own experience. On the title there, you can see my half experience as innovator and entrepreneur. I mean, this half is something in between the Mac computer and the PC computer that I was, uh, it's a surprise for me too. I very often had wondered about what are the prerequisites, the driving forces, and the triggers to be an innovator and an entrepreneur, or inventor and an entrepreneur. In my case, the prerequisite has very much been this, my father's workshop. He was repairing all kinds of small engines, like motorcycles, mopeds, outboard marine engine, lawn mowers, and now and then also a car engine or a tractor, or even a truck from time to time. And he always joked with me and said, what if you can invent an engine that always starts and never fail. And that I have buried with me all my life. And um, of course, this small engine, I was forced to work with him on my summer vacations and summer holidays from the school and all that. But uh, when I got my driving license, I was more interested of cars. And, and I had no money, um, so I bought this car for 300 Swedish krona. It was terrible rusty, and you know the joint between the body and the mud guards uh, are a bolted joint, which is a very bad solution because it became rusty all the time. But I became an expert on welding rusty cheat metal, that's for sure. Um, and I had to use several kilograms of plastic padding on this car. But in the final end, it becomes a, a pretty nice car. And you can see on, on this that there is a, no so, uh, other than solid joint between the mud guard and the body. And I took away the bumpers, of course, because they were no meaning with the bumpers. Uh, and um, this is from the rear. You can ex see that um, I add something on, on the rear end instead of the bumper. Uh, and I would say that I was about 25 years ahead of the car industry, because all cars today look more or less like this. as a fully integrated body and no separate standalone bumpers. So this is, I'm very proud of being 25 years ahead, but I have not gained any money for that. Um, when a small engine fail, it's basically two reasons. Either it's the ignition system or it's the fuel delivery, the carburetor. Um, carburetors, was pure mechanics, pretty simple, straightforward to understand. But the ignition, the electric or electromagnetic phenomena that was involved in all ignition systems in small engines was a little bit difficult to understand for me. So th my focus was to understand and perhaps improve that. So my thesis work at Chalmers University in 1973 had the title of Optoelectronic Ignition Advance for uh, Combustion Engines. And that was basically for car engines. And the last page of that says that you can most likely eliminate the mechanical distributor and get a solid state ignition system with no uh, mechanical moving parts. You should also make this as one unit to make it more simple and robust. And instead of a distributor, you need 
one ignition coil per cylinder. In fact, I, um, in 1973, in the autumn, I went to Volvo, presented this thesis work, and they told me that, Mr. Johansson, it's for sure a very good idea, but uh, you know, we are buying our ignition system from Bosch, and we are extremely satisfied with that. So that was the first kick in the ass, so to speak. Um, In 1976, I started as a development engineer in um, Svenska Elektromagneter, one or the only in ignition manufacturer in Sweden, uh, with the aim of developing this again. But the board of directors in that company says, you know, Hasse, that this is extremely challenging and too risky to go into the business in the automotive industry. We are dealing with ignition system for small engines, chainsaws, moped, outboard marine engines, and so on. And um, we want you to continue to develop that and improve the products that we already have. OK. Second time. Nevertheless, I made this sketch uh, based on a patent uh, that I got from um, outboard marine engine solution for this company. And um, I did my very best to try to sell the idea once more. And now I was a little bit more lucky. Because at this time, Saab has just launched a turbocharged engine. And you know that uh, a turbocharged engine has higher compression pressure than a normal aspirated engine, which means that the requirement of the ignition voltage is much higher. And with a conventional distributor in this Saab engine, with half a meter of high tension leads to the other side of the valve cover to the spark plugs, they had significant issues with this. So all of a sudden, my proposal to have one coil on each spark plug, manufacture as one unit, creating higher voltage than you can do with a distributor delivery system, was very interesting. So on that way, we started. I made this um, project plan. You see it started in May 1982, and start of production was in January 85. The, the first part of the project was 14 months, and if I remember right, I got about, the, the project budget was 75,000 euro. It's not much money today, but it was significant money at that point in time. I convinced Saab Scania, especially the Scania division in Södertälje that was responsible for the engine development, design and manufacturing for the Saab cars, uh, that it is possible to do this. Uh, I got the contract under the condition that I had to give away all intellectual properties for free to Saab Scania. Then they would be able to pay an hourly rate for me to develop that, and that was the trigger to starting my own engineering company, Mikkel AB, in 1982. I started that with a colleague. Uh, we were three employees to start with, and um, we really were successful with this each step. And in the contract it says that if you don't deliver what is written after each step, we can break the contract without any uh, penalty fee or something to you. So that was a pretty tough business environment uh, you have to survive as an inventor. Then in 
Now, this is the coil mounted direct on the spark plug. It's a little bit special design with the primary winding outside the secondary winding, which was not the conventional solution at that point in time. The isolation for the high tension in this transformer or ignition coil was transformer oil. And um, that was also tricky to get it tight enough. You can see the O-ring tightening here. That's created a lot of headache with the leaks and things like that. So there was a lot of issues that has to be solved. The red part here is the cartridge, the cassette. That is the one unit that I already had in my thesis work as a kind of vision for the future. But the real invention with this was when Mr. Gilbrand was the head of engine development and design at Saab, said that I don't want to have a separate sensor for sensing the, whether it's the combustion stroke or the exhaust stroke in my engines. I want you to use the spark plug because you have the spark plug there in the middle of the combustion chamber. And I told him, Pair, um, even if you have the spark plug from a mechanical point of view in the combustion chamber, you can never use the spark plug as a sensor. You have more than 40,000 volts around the spark plug. It, it's not possible to capture any uh, significant signal. Uh, are you quite sure? I'm not an electrical engineering he, engineer, he said, but I have a feeling that it could be possible. And it was possible, really. We worked hard, and then we developed a piece of voltage source and the current measurements part in the low tension side of the ignition coil. Here, in this end, on the spark plug, you have these 40,000 volts. But here, you have the voltage close to ground. So by doing this, it is possible. But you have to deal with the winding the high tension winding in between the measurement in the spark plug gap and the electronic circuits here, uh, which made you to make this very special design uh, ignition coil. Otherwise, it doesn't work. While bias a voltage over the spark gap, you could detect whether it's combustion or not, which means misfire. You can even detect knocking behavior in the combustion and um, pre-ignition behavior in the engine and even measure the air-fuel ratio to a certain extent. Today, this is used in many cars um, in the world, manufacturers in the world today. So this is the real invention, but that was more of a kind of happening during this development journey. And this created the trionic engine management system where you integrated all this function for controlling the engine and the uh, combustion, turbocharging and all that. A significant experience from my point of view was then when I was accused for have stolen all these ideas from somebody else. And that was in the beginning, before I got the contract from Saab. I was eager to launch this idea. I talked to many people, explained my ideas to many people, and all of a sudden, one certain person took this and then applied for a patent which was not accepted, uh, of course, as I had already uh, uh, filed my patents on this. But nevertheless, uh, this was a kind of uh, mafia situation with uh, American lawyers. I was accused both in Sweden and in um, uh, Washington, D.C. 
and in Connecticut, where Scania or Saab of America had its headquarter. Um, it was not very nice. It just tells you that you have to be very careful when you disclose and uh, open up uh, your ideas to anybody, whom else it will be, uh, without having a patent or without having some kind of protection anyway. Nevertheless, they had uh, to give up in the final end, but uh, I feel very bad during this period of time, I can tell you. After a couple of years, I became responsible for uh, advanced engineering in, in uh, Europe for Delphi Automotive System as a part of General Motors. And uh, this was a result of the partnership between Saab and General Motors regarding the passenger cars. Um, this experience is how difficult it is to take military technology to commercial products. This is a forward-looking radar. And in the fighter aircraft, they had a forward-looking radar with mechanical scanned antennas. It was quality assured for fighter aircraft. So it was, the first thinking was that it's obviously good enough for a car, but that was not the case. This technology is available on most cars today, uh, roughly 10 years later, this was in mid 90s, uh, but with electronically scanned radar antennas. Uh, because this was not possible. I mean, the environment in a passenger car or in a truck, if you want, is much worse than in a fighter aircraft. So that was a good experience. Don't think that you can take military uh, technology direct to commercial products. Often it's uh, too expensive to do it, but when it's also uh, cost effective enough to do it, the design is not appropriate in many times. Another experience from my um, time at Scania is a difficult to have the politicians to take appropriate decisions, even if it's obvious. In this case, when it comes to aerodynamics, you can reduce the air drag of a truck by having a 1.5 meter long tail on the trailer with 5%. 5% is about 10 years of engine development. And you can imagine what that costs you when you have about 1,000 engineers uh, working with engine development for 10 years. Um, this will cost a couple of uh, 100 euros uh, the key here is that you are not allowed to drive longer vehicle combination when it comes to trucks than 16.5 meter in Europe, except for Sweden and Finland, where we are allowed to drive 25.25 meter long. But the politician says that global warming, CO2 emission is extremely important for us, we have to reduce it. We have to do whatever we can to do it. In this case, they can reduce it overnight by changing the regulation of length of the vehicle combination. They could reduce the emission with 5% immediately. Nothing happened. Another experience I have is that um, It could also be a lot of internal resistance. These driving support, launched as a product, Scania driving support, something that we worked with about in, in, in three years at Scania and on development. And during that period, that was at least 50% of all engineers, all the management says that this is nothing. This is nothing that the driver uh, uh, accept. This is nothing that the driver like. This is nothing that uh, this is something that we should not 
introduced to the market. I was driving this very hard, and in the final end, in the autumn of 2009, we launched this, and it became a success. It's a device, you can call it the real-time driving learning, and you can if you are an appropriate driver, you can have this number at 100%. It's uh, hill taking, it's um, prediction of future braking need, and this is braking uh, um, behavior, you can say, then this is gear shifting. And, and if you do that in the most appropriate way, you have 100%. Uh, my experience driving many times with these kind of equipment is that you can keep it at 100% for about one hour then you are too tired to continue, which gives you another signal that's saying that you, you need a more an kind of autopilot to keep this at 100%. So there is a second step in this development. And I hope that Scania would launch that within a couple of years from now anyway. Last slide is back to the decision Lack of decision, I would say, again. These 16.5 meter combinations that are allowed in the rest of Europe, except Sweden and Finland, has a fuel consumption of about 30 liters per 100 kilometers. If you increase the length to 25.25, which means that you get 50% more cargo, you only increase the fuel consumption with 20 to 30 percent. Uh, the difference in this number, 35 to 40, is dependent on what kind of total weight. This 16.5 in Europe is a 40 ton combination, total weight combination. Uh, in Sweden and Finland, we are allowed to have 60 ton on this 25.25 meter. So if you have a 60 ton combination, 25 meter, it takes about 40 liter. But if it's still 40 ton, it's only 35. And that means that you can reduce a CO2 emission by around 20-25% per transported ton kilometer immediately. And this is allowed in Sweden and Finland, which means it's also allowed in every single European Union country. So there is only a decision that has to be taken, and then overnight you can reduce the CO2 emission by 20 to 25 percent. I'm still waiting for the decision to be made so we can reduce. But um, so far, there is no decision. And now you may ask probably why. And if you listen very carefully in the corridors in Brussels, and now I will stick out my neck and tell you the truth, it says that we can't allow this 25 meters combination because in that case the road transport will be too efficient and too competitive compared with the railroads. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hatter.